So objectives today, we're going to review the common appearance of frequently encountered uh, bone lesions in the ED, whether incidental or not. Uh, we're going to try and understand the emergent complications uh, that uh, bring people with bone lesions to the ED, mostly pathologic fracture, and then uh, recommend appropriate clinical or imaging follow-up. And a big part of this in these lesions, which are relatively rare, is to work educating the, uh, the ED providers about these entities. So this is an interesting format for this lecture. It's going to be rapid case-based learning. I'm going to show about 10 cases uh, pretty quickly. Leave the map up for about seven seconds. Uh, think about the diagnosis, what recommendations you would make if you were at the workstation. Uh, then we're going to go through uh, each of the 10 cases, one minute each, uh, talk about the actual pathologic diagnosis, uh, what imaging follow-up was done, and then try to learn just a couple key facts from each diagnosis and review some take-home points. So we're focusing here on primary bone lesions in the ED, but keep in mind at the workstation, uh, metastatic lesions to bone are about 25 times more common. So you're going to see those uh, far more in the course of your daily practice. And when you see uh, bone lesions, they're challenging. They lead to misdiagnosis a lot of the time, uh, recommendations for unnecessary additional imaging. They are somewhat frequently encounters. It does depend on your practice and the population you're working with, but somewhere between 2% and 10% of MSK radiographs have some sort of lesion. And then they can be serious, obviously, including uh, malignancy and infection. So some brief background, uh, some of the terminology we use for these lesions. We talk about bone lesions as indolent or aggressive, and those are descriptive uh, the, uh, words parallel benign versus malignant in pathology. There's some important exceptions. Osteomyelitis uh, and uh, Langerhans cell histiocytosis can look aggressive but are benign, and then giant cell tumor uh, can look indolent but can be malignant. Uh, radiographic lesion margination uh, reflects the biologic aggressiveness of these lesions, and when we look at these x-rays, we want to think about the margin character, uh, what it looks like in the zone of transition, whether it's wide or narrow, and in particular, a sclerotic uh, margin suggests indolent growth, which has allowed the bone around it uh, to wall off the, uh, the lesion itself. And then I want you to uh, look at the lesion matrix when we're looking at these, the location both within the long axis of bone and also the cross section, so marrow, uh, cortical, or even extra osseous, and then consider the patient age, which is important. So here we go. I'm going to give you some history while we're showing these. Uh, this was a 21-year-old uh, female who came in with a palpable mass. She had noticed it for a couple years, thought it was getting bigger, and then kept kind of rubbing her distal thigh, came in and got these x-rays and they, uh, they called you in the reading room to see what you wanted to do next. Our second case, this was a 22-year-old guy. He had uh, had pain in his knee for quite a while and then had been limping more recently and then came into the ED, got this knee series. Our third patient, 14-year-old female, she was playing with her friends on a swing set and uh, while she was on the monkey bars, had some acute pain in her upper extremity and was brought into the emergency department by her parents. 78-year-old woman who had progressive pain in her shoulder for several months uh, eventually became debilitating, was self-medicating at home, and then uh, came in and got this uh, shoulder radiographic series. This was a 27-year-old uh, female. She had had progressive wrist swelling for quite a while, was uninsured, and kept delaying uh, medical care, and then finally presented uh, to one of our EDs and got this wrist series. 17-year-old guy uh, presented with left knee pain. This was a patient who came to triage, had overall chest and abdominal pain. We got CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. I'm just showing you here this sclerotic lesion in the left uh, pubis, and we've measured the Hounsfield units of this lesion, uh, and now uh, just want to figure out how we're going to handle that. 57-year-old guy was uh, actually opening a window in his own house with both his hands and then had acute uh, pain uh, in his pinky finger. Patient 9, 18-year-old with left thigh pain who was using a motorized scooter in Atlanta, fell off and then presented to the ED. And our last case, 7-year-old guy came in for the first time to our institution uh, with pain in his hip and got this hip series looking for fracture. Okay, so that was a whirlwind uh, 
tour of bone tumors. So patient one, this is an osteochondroma. Uh, they can be sessile, as in this case, or stalk-like. Uh, the important feature here is that they have contiguity with the marrow cavity. This is the most common benign tumor of bone. It's also by far the most common tumor that presents to orthopedists as symptomatic. Often this is uh, mechanical in nature, um, so mechanical compression or impingement of nerves or muscles. Um, so you do see these in the ED, in the workup. Um, very rare rate of malignant transformation, less than 1% in solitary lesions. And then obviously if they get to more advanced imaging, a cartilage cap of greater than 1.5 centimeters uh, in a skeletally mature patient can be a sign of malignant transformation. Uh, we rarely do further workup of these lesions in the ED. You just tell the ED provider that it's probably mechanical if patients are presenting uh, with symptoms and there's no other features here. Uh, patient two, and this was an osteosarcoma. You can see this um, ill-defined, both uh, lytic and sclerotic lesion. There's loss of the cortex here, and then this new bone formation, almost a heron on, heron end periosteal reaction, um, both medially and dorsally. Um, these lesions obviously require uh, further uh, imaging for workup and treatment. This was the MR in this patient. You can see we have high T2 signal and low T1 signal. The solid components do enhance on MR. And you can see these uh, small regions of low signal, a combination of bone and blood products within the tumor. Uh, this uh, tumor extended into the joint space. This patient was actually treated with a, a limb sparing procedure where they got a complete arthroplasty and then a long segment reconstruction and, and he did fine. Um, this is the most common malignant tumor of bone. Um, a little bit of a male predominance. Uh, about two-thirds of these lesions occur around the knee. So if you're going to see these uh, coming into the ED, it often is around the knee. And then 75% of these tumors present in patients who are less than 20. 90% uh, are metaphyseal, but they can get quite large and they can extend into either the epiphysis or the diaphysis uh, when you see them at the workstation. This is the, uh, the classic kind of textbook appearance of the cloud-like osseous matrix that we talk about. These are bone-forming tumors, and when they form bone, you can see this almost cotton ball-like appearance in these larger lesions. Um, this was also a young man, and this lesion was arising from the inferior uh, pubic ramus. Our patient three, um, you can see this, this was an ABC with a pathologic fracture. These are eccentrically located. They have a sharp, narrow zone of transition. They often lack a matrix on plain film. Uh, look for this pathologic fracture. You can see um, they're non-displaced here. In the ED, if you think these may have a pathologic fracture, CT is a great modality to look at them, look for them. These lesions can also occur in the uh, pelvis and spine. As, oh, if you're unsure about the characteristics of these lesions, CT is a good way um, for further workup. Um, some of these patients go to MR where you can see these septations and then classically uh, this uh, layering fluid, fluid lasers, uh, if I had shown you the axial images here. 80% um, of these patients are less than 20, 50% uh, occur in long bones, and then uh, CT is a great tool for working these up. This is another example and another patient who came into our ED, and I'm just uh, showing you these to highlight these classic fluid, fluid layers within these uh, aneurysmal bone cysts. Patient four, uh, this was a chondrosarcoma. This is a very aggressive looking lesion. You can see it's a lytic. There's no uh, internal matrix here. It's moth eaten. We have areas of uh, cortical endosteal scalloping where the cortex is thinned from the inside and then frank cortical destruction. It's the second most common um, primary malignant tumor of bone. Uh, and this is a tumor of the elderly, so peaking in the mid 80s. We really shouldn't be seeing these lesions in, in young patients. And then, uh, the absence of chondroid matrix in these lesions uh, uh, speaks to a de-differentiated tumor, so a higher grade chondrosarcoma, as in this case. Um, often when we're talking about these lesions, we get questions about enchondromas and, and the differentiation between an enchondroma or a low-grade chondrosarcoma. These are some of the characteristics. Uh, for me, the endosteal cortical scalloping is helpful. Um, greater than two-thirds cortical depth is a bad sign, a sign that you may be dealing with a low-grade chondrosarcoma. Expansile cortical remodeling is when the bone balloons out and the cortex thickens at the same time. And then these more overt uh, bony destruction and then the size of the lesion. I'm gonna show two quick examples of that. These are both um, enchondromas in different patients who present incidentally to the ED um, with, uh, with trauma. And then zooming in on these lesions, which I think is great to look at the cortex, you can see this lesion on the left has uh, less than two-thirds thickness, just some uh, scalloping of the undersurface of the cortex. This is okay. 
This lesion on the right, we have this much deeper endosteal cortical scalloping, greater than two-thirds thickness, and this lesion was eventually resected and was a low-grade chondrosarcoma. Patient five, this extremely uh, large, expansile, bubbly, lytic lesion. It's at the articular end of the bone. Um, this was a giant cell tumor. Uh, these have narrow zone of transition. They occur in patients after um, physeal closure, um, and they, they can expand the cortex without destroying it. 60% of these occur in long bones. And again, we have a predominance around the knee. Um, you can see these uh, most commonly in patients who are 20 to 30 years of age, and they do have an indolent course but can locally recur, uh, and uh, some of these tumors met metastasize to the lung, and you can do metastatectomies for this. Unfortunately, this uh, lesion was so large that this patient uh, ended up with an amputation. The surgeons were unable to reconstruct and do a limb-sparing procedure for this lesion. Patient six, another uh, osteosarcoma. I show this as a high-grade telangiectatic osteosarcoma. Similar to chondrosarcomas, when they're very high-grade, the cells lose the ability to produce um, new bone formation, and so uh, these telangiectatic osteosarcomas often lack uh, the bone-forming properties of some of the lower-grade osteosarcomas. And you can see here, this is a very shaggy lesion, a wide zone of transition. We have frank cortical destruction and dorsally uh, um, in this, uh, in this osteosarcoma. Again, the most common malignant uh, tumor of bone. This is a spectrum of osteosarcomas. This was our bone-forming tumor. This a lesion that started in the metaphysis and extended into the diaphysis with this very aggressive hair on end periosteal reaction and new bone formation. And then this was the tumor we saw earlier. Patient seven, there have been a number of great papers recently talking about uh, differentiating these bone islands from sclerotic metastatic lesions based on their Hounsfield units. Uh, these, this is some of the information from these papers you can see in your handout. I want to highlight what I use at the workstation, um, a maximum Hounsfield units of greater than 1125 or a mean of greater than 875. Um, is indicative of a bone island. Um, there's some differentiation depending on how sensitive or specific you want to be. Um, you can fine tune it to your own practice, but I think these are, uh, these are good values. And this did end up being a bone island in this patient at long-term follow-up, even though this patient did have uh, prostate cancer. Patient eight, we have this lytic lesion. It has no appreciable internal matrix. This is an enchondroma um, with a pathologic fracture through it. Um, these lesions in the hands and feet often lack cartilaginous matrix. They can be very expansile and they can thin the cortex. So unlike um, enchondromas in other areas of the body, if the cortex is thinned or scalloped in the hands and feet, it is not an indicator of malignant transformation. And some of these lesions, if they really thin bone and predispose to multiple pathologic fractures, end up getting curatage and cement packing um, so these patients can maintain function. You have a various spectrum of imaging appearance. I highlight this one on the right because when they're very eccentric, they can be called juxtacortical or subcortical chondromas and can look a little bit funny um, at the workstation. Patient nine, uh, a typical appearance of a non-ossifying fibroma, this uh, cortically based, eccentric, lobulated, lytic, bubbly lesion. It has very sharp margination, narrow zone of transition. Um, up to one-third of children we image can, we can see these in, so we see them very frequently. I always thought it was interesting. They, they're uh, often metaphyseal in origin, but as the bone grows, they migrate, or they appear to migrate into the diaphysis, and obviously the bones are elongating quite quickly in this um, age group. Uh, in this patient, we, interestingly, the, uh, the person who was seeing this patient in the ED was concerned a about a pathologic fracture, so CT'd this. Um, pathologic fractures of NOF are exceedingly rare, and almost all of the ones that are reported occur in very large lesions in the lower extremity. This is what they look like on MR. And then this uh, patient, if you get a, uh, a follow-up, they appear to ossify where the, uh, the bone is healing from the outside in. And then our last patient, this was a polyostatic fibrous dysplasia. This can be quite a tricky diagnosis. 
Um, it's often seen in young adults who present for the first time um, for imaging if it's not a known diagnosis. Uh, this patient did have uh, outside imaging that confirmed that this was stable. Um, monoostotic fibrous dysplasia we see much more commonly, and that occurs uh, in the ribs, the femur, or craniofacial. But polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, if you see this um, irregular architectural distortion with lytic uh, regions of bone in the femur, tibia, pelvis, um, think about this diagnosis and uh, potentially you may have to image uh, other portions of the extremity or the patient need, may need follow-up but um, can, save, uh, can save the patient a workup. In uh, the head and face, um, fibrous dysplasia often has this expansile ground glass appearance, another thing we see uh, quite frequently in ED imaging incidentally. And thank you very much for your time.